Welcome to Understanding the Inclusion of PMDD in the ICD-11. Today we are joined by Dr. Tori eisner mull who is the IAPMD Clinical Advisory Board Chair. She is also the Associate Director of Translational Research in Women's Mental Health at the University of Illinois. This session is to explain the fantastic news about PMDD being added into the ICD-11. Fantastic news, which means PMDD is now an international diagnosis. You can read the full position statement. We have added a link in the comments. I'm the Clinical Advisory Board Chair at IAPMD, um, and I uh, have the honor of um, helping to um, determine some of the um, scientific and medical recommendations that IAPMD makes for um, folks in the uh, patient community and also trying to educate the provider community. I'm a scientist um, who studies the menstrual cycle and mood um, that includes PMDD and premenstrual exacerbation of underlying disorders. I'm particularly interested in um, things like aggression and suicide risk and substance abuse in addition to um, sadness, anxiety, irritability, and the typical mood symptoms. Um, some of the more um, risky behaviors are really interesting to me as well. I'm also a clinical psychologist and I see um, patients with premenstrual disorders um, in the clinic. I see only patients who have failed sort of first-line treatments for PMDD and PME. Um, and so I see a lot of people um, who um, have sort of been through the ringer and, and seen a lot of different kinds of providers. Okay, so what is the ICD? Um, so the International um, Classification of Diseases is the sort of the shorthand um, ICD. Um, it's in the 11th version now. It's a way for medical providers, scientists, and policymakers around the world to sort of get on the same page about how medical disorders are defined, how they're classified, um, how they're, and, and to a certain extent, how they're tracked and treated as well. Um, just a couple of examples, so when a doctor is trained in one country and then moves to another, the ICD codes can provide sort of a shared language of medical disorders and appropriate treatments across um, the global community so that there's more, um, a more sort of seamless transition from one culture to the next. When a scientist wants to estimate, you know, how common is diabetes in the world, um, it's really helpful that we have a common coding system um, so that all of the diagnoses that are made around the world using the ICD classification system um, all show the same code. And so researchers can go in and use data that's already um, sort of de-identified, but it's already been collected um, about patients around the world and can have sort of a standardized view of how many people have been diagnosed with this particular code around the world. And so it really streamlines our understanding of disorders um, and helps us to move sort of a global platform forward about um, how medical disorders work. So that's the ICD-10. It's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful um, uh, production of the um, World Health Organization, um, which I believe has connections to the United Nations as well. So it's um, a wonderful global um, enterprise. So it's very exciting that PMDD has been included. Why has it been included? That may be obvious to some of us since we're here and we care about this stuff, but let's talk about what their um, sort of qualifications are for including a disorder. So the two, I think, sort of main ones that people would agree on would be scientific validity, so evidence that it's a real disorder that causes distress and interferes with people's lives. Um, anybody who's following IAPMD probably knows that that's definitely the case for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Other um, uh, inclusion criteria is clinical utility, so is the diagnosis useful for um, identifying people who need treatment and getting them the treatment that they need. And, and that one obviously also is the case for PMDD. And the scientific validity side, you know, it's been mounting in the last 30 or 40 years, particularly in psychiatry and neuroscience, but in some um, gynecology labs as well. Um, there have been a lot of scientists trying to push forward this understanding of the biology of premenstrual dysphoric disorder, um, how it plays out in the body, including the brain. 
we've you know clearly documented that that uh, in research studies, not just sort of seeing it clinically, but we've clearly documented in research studies that you know causes extreme distress um, for the people who have PMDD. It um, interferes with their life um, often to an extreme degree, and so those that index of scientific validity is very clear. Um, particularly after um, PMDD was added to the DSM-5 in 2013 by the American Psychiatric Association. And we'll talk a little bit more about that psychiatric gynecological um, um, divide or, you know, fake divide. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But the, the inclusion of, the PMD, of PMDD in the um, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders by the American Psychiatric Association in 2013. It was very controversial and a lot of people had to fight really hard, mostly psychiatrists had to fight really hard to get it included um, because there were a lot of people who believed that um, we were sort of pathologizing normal female function and that, you know, PMS is normal and so, you know, we should just, um, you know, stop um, uh, so, so somebody just said, I can't work. Yeah, so it's clearly not the case, right, that PMDD is just, it's just PMS and it's just normal, right? But yet that's, you know, the, um, the message that a lot of people um, were, were putting out there when there was this um, push to make PMDD part of the, the DSM-5, or the, the American Psychiatric Association's um, sort of brain disorder manual. Um, and so, you know, I think we, I, you know, I'm really thankful to all those psychiatrists who really push to say, no, my patients with this disorder are really impaired. They're really distressed. This is not normal PMS. It really needs to, um, uh, you know, become recognized as a disorder that is not normal, but that requires diagnosis and treatment and, and that attention that a medical disorder really really gets. Another reason that the, that the ICD has included it is because the DSM-5 included it and um, the, um, the ICD has historically really looked to the DSM-5 as sort of a template for um, the disorders of the brain um, uh, like you know depression, anxiety, um, schizophrenia, um, and so, you know, the, the DSM-5's inclusion of PMDD really facilitated um, and paved the way for the ICD-11's uh, inclusion of PMDD. Let's see, there's a question here. Um, yeah, how we can bring more awareness of PMDD in the field of psychology um, in light of the ICD inclusion. What a great question. So I'm a clinical psychologist. Um, I've also had um, four years or five years of training in um, reproductive mood disorders, you know, in the biology of reproductive mood disorders, but I um, am really believe that psychologists can play a really important role in the diagnosis and management of um, PMDD and, and PME of underlying disorders. They can really take the time to differentially diagnose people and make sure that, you know, we understand what things are cyclical and what things aren't and what you know, what, what are we looking to sort of change with the cycle-based treatments? Um, so I think that's really important. Um, and I, I wrote a um, review recently in the clinical psychologist that's a primer and research agenda for um, psychologists in premenstrual disorders. It's designed for um, psychologists, um, but, but really anybody could read it, I think, and it's um, not sort of it's, it's written with psychologists in mind and sort of the fact that psychologists in, most psychologists are not prescribers of medication. And so what does that mean for sort of management and things like that? But we have more work to do. I really want to write either a, um, like a manual for creating a, an integrative treatment program that includes psychologists as well as physicians and gynecologists and all those. Um, or a book, um, so I, I, I've got a, I've got that percolating. But um, I think we need just, we need just a, like instructions, right, for how to do that. Um, what does this inclusion mean for patients now and in the future? So um, I talked a little bit about what ICD does, um, you know, what the the purposes, the purpose of it is. But just to sort of bullet point it. It, it ensures that the disorder is now recognized globally as a legitimate medical condition that is separate from PMS, separate from premenstrual tension, and is something that requires diagnosis and treatment.
in the United States, I, and I think to a certain extent, other English speaking countries, you know, there, there has been progress along those lines. I get the sense that there's less progress um, elsewhere, just I think just because a lot of the, um, you know, advocates and researchers that originally did this work are in English speaking countries, um, not all, but, but a lot. I think Sweden as well has been sort of a leader. Um, but I think outside of that, this really gives us a platform to say outside of those countries, now, you know, it's in the official sort of global diagnostic platform. And so we can hopefully um, start to see, um, you know, it legitimized in other countries. So hopefully physicians of all specialties will be um, more likely to be trained in PMDD, you know, spotting it, diagnosing it, potentially treating it. Um, certainly, uh, at the very least, recognizing it as real um, and referring if they don't feel that they have adequate um, expertise to um, make a, a diagnosis or, or provide treatment. Medical reimbursement is something that I'm hoping will improve. So there have been, you know, I often as a clinician have to write letters um, to insurance companies asking them to cover Lupron and other advanced treatments for um, PMDD and um, I'm hoping that because you know it's 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 still sort of in this no man's land of you know is this is this really real is this is a psychiatric disorder why are you prescribing a you know hormone suppressant you know things like that so um, I'm hoping that the medical reimbursement will um, improve as a result of this. You know, one main consequence is that people around the world with PMDD hopefully will um, feel validated by this, you know, that what they are experiencing is real and it's not in their heads. There are just, there's just not enough awareness among providers and this is something that the clinical advisory board at IAPMD and we really want to focus on making sure that providers of all of all specialties are aware of this because it's something that um, you know G GPs, general practitioners need to be able to spot. Gynecologists, obviously, psychiatrists, psychologists, any kind of therapist, um, but also potentially um, pain specialists. You know, um, just because their pain is part of this disorder, sleep disorder specialists. Um, you know, there's just there's a lot of um, of areas that need. Um, to be trained in, in spotting this. Okay. Um, the ICD billing code is available online. Um, if you search the ICD-11 and you go to the browser and you put premenstrual dysphoric disorder in the left-hand corner, you'll be able to see, to see it. Okay. Um, how will this shape the way IAPMD can advocate for better patient outcomes? So, um, the clinical advisory board, as I've said, you know, right now we really want to focus on training providers because, you know, our first step was sort of making sure that there's good evidence-based information out on the internet for people with premenstrual disorders. And, you know, so we revamped the website. We really tried to, um, we created new treatment guidelines that really honor, hopefully, just the variety of treatments that may be helpful, while also highlighting the ones that we think are most likely to be helpful. Once we, once we did that, you know, we, we wanted to now focus on provider education because it, at a certain point, it becomes very, very frustrating if you are an, essentially an expert patient, right? And none of the, pro, no provider knows anything about your disorder. That's so frustrating, right? And so if we are at IAPMD, if we're, you know, just sort of creating a million expert patients, that's, it's great. It's great to, for patients to be knowledgeable about their condition and advocate, and we want that, and it's amazing. And it really shouldn't be all the patient patient's job to, you know, fully the patient's job to, to um, diagnose, select a treatment, you know, um, and, and make it all happen. Really, the providers should be knowledgeable. And so we're creating a series of um, webinars um, and a series of paid continuing education and continuing medical education videos and, and courses so that we can hopefully um, really reach the provider community. We also created an IAPMD Clinical Advisory Board Twitter to try to reach out some to different professional organizations and increase our visibility that way. So. Um, 
so yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping that the inclusion of ICD will further legitimize those efforts across different specialties. So previously, you know, um, gynecologists who we maybe um, would, would reach out to would say, well, you know, that's a, it's a psychiatric disorder, so, you know, I'm not sure. Um, but now it's in the ICD-11, um, it's, it's fully um, applicable to all physicians now. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, and not that it wasn't before, but I think it just it legitimizes it further that um, all physicians hopefully have a, a responsibility to at least be aware that it is uh, a real disorder that they need to either diagnose and treat or refer for. Um, and so we're going to really be trying to reach out to um, to um, healthcare providers of a variety of training, not just physicians, um, but especially physicians, to increase that awareness and um, you know using the ICD-11 inclusion as sort of a a main bullet point there of like this is why you need to know about this. It's a new it's a new disorder in ICD-11. The other um, the other thing, yeah, is that you know. It, Evidence-based treatment for algorithms for PMDD in particular require a lot of different clinical skill sets. You know, um, you need to be able to do differential diagnosis with other disorders that can cause emotional um, uh, and behavioral problems. You need to be able to um, uh, prescribe SSRIs and titrate those appropriately. Um, you need to be able to potentially trial oral contraceptives. If that's something a person hasn't tried, that can provide relief for a lot of people. Not not most of the people here, probably, but for a lot of people, it is helpful. Um, and then and then moving on. Most importantly, um, we need to be able to advocate for providers to learn how to um, in in cases that require it to learn how to administer GnRH agonists, which um, are things like Lupron um, that um, create the medical, the temporary medical menopause that helps us to see, you know, whether the symptoms go away when we um, sort of set this, the hormonal levels to zero for a while. Um, and also it can be a long-term treatment with um, stable long-term hormone add back without any fluctuations. Um, and also um, uh, oophorectomies or removal of the ovaries is a life-saving treatment for many people with severe PMDD. And, um, you know, so my point is that all of these different um, treatments, you know, many of these treatments require very different skill sets. You know, surgery is a very specific skill set that a gynecologic surgeon will have. Um, Differential diagnosis of, you know, PMDD from things like bipolar disorder, um, you know, um, not that you can't have both because you can, but, you know, things like that, you know, very difficult thing. And if you're not trained to do that, um, maybe because you're um, a gynecologist, for example, you know, having a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist or another mental health professional around to help figure out what's cycling and what's not is incredibly important and helpful. Um, psychiatrists are really the experts in, um, you know, all of the, the dosing, the titration, the um, uh, et cetera, you know, with SSRIs. So, you know, those, uh, those experts are really important to, to honor in this group as well. So I think all of these different groups, you know, have different areas of expertise and we really need them to be working in teams. Um, and I'm hoping that um, PMD, I'm hoping that IAPMD can advocate for better outcomes using this, hopefully with uh, an eye toward mul building multi multidisciplinary teams for the treatment of PMDD. Um, so here in, in um, at University of Illinois at Chicago, um, I'm building a team to do that where we can, you know, um, obviously psychiatrists um, <clears throat> to do the, the um, initial um, SSRIs, oral contraceptives, um, Lupron injections, and then someone, and then a gynecologic surgeon to refer to in extreme cases where, you know, we, nothing else works. Um, so, you know, building those teams are important. I think that this will help us to say, you know, this is a, this is a, a complicated disorder with a complicated biology, and we need a team of experts that can really cover the um, cover all of those areas of expertise um, because no single one of us, you know, um, can can really do that. I mean, maybe 
Um, maybe somebody who did is like double board certified in psychiatry and gynecology or something, for example, but that's not going to be most providers and there's not going to be enough of those people to help all of the people that need help. Okay. Um, all right. So now let's go to the, we've all, the, the showdown we've all been waiting for is, is PMDD a gynecological problem or is it a mental health problem? So this is a, many patients with PMDD understandably feel very upset by the idea that they have a mental disorder. Um, and this makes sense because if you look at our broader <clears throat> culture, there's a ton of stigma around having a mental disorder. Also in the media, psychiatry and psychology are still portrayed as um, uh, uh, fields that are very much um, mysterious and um, kind of have this like you're gonna lay on a couch and you know tell people about your mother or about your dreams or something. And that's just not how either of the fields work anymore. They're both scientifically based um, um, uh, specialties that focus on correcting brain and behavioral um, issues that we know all intertwine brain and behavior, all are sort of two sides of the same coin. And so there's a lot of this stigma around mental health, around psychiatry, around all this stuff. That I think is, it's totally understandable then for somebody not to want to have a psychiatric disorder or brain disorder, right? Because there is all this stigma. Why would you want to be associated with that? Why would you want to be called crazy? And women are called crazy too often anyway, right? So um, it's totally understandable to have that reaction and not want that. Um, however, when we say a gynecologic disorder, um, what we mean is that there's something physically wrong with um, the with the reproductive system, right? So there's a problem um, or a disease or an abnormality in the uterus, the ovaries, the vagina, the right. So all of the the female reproductive um, organs and how they all interact. That there's some kind of pathology. There's some kind of disease there. There's some kind of um, hormonal imba uh, imbalance, or you know, like in PCOS or endometriosis or um, I guess endometriosis is a little different, but um, it, it, it's sort of to call something a gynecologic disorder, you know, is in my view, typically means that there's something wrong happening down there and we need to treat the, what's going wrong down there. In PMDD, it's tricky because there is nothing going wrong down there from what we can tell. Now, certainly there are people who have both PMDD and dysmenorrhea or um, endometriosis or polycystic ovarian syndrome or one of these other gynecologic disorders, adenomyosis, um, and absolutely that, you know, is a separate issue. But, um, but since, you know, years and years of research, we haven't <clears throat> been able to find any um, problem with the, the female reproductive system itself, you know, seems to be very healthy in PMDD. There's, you know, hormone levels are normal, hormone patterns are normal. Um, the way hormones um, affect um, <clears throat> other many other bodily systems, not necessarily the brain, seems to be normal. So it's a little um, confusing because we would think since symptoms arise in the luteal phase when hormones are risen and are fluctuating, that there would be some kind of hormonal imbalance or some kind of gynecologic problem. But it, we just can't find it after you know, 30, 40 years. If there was something wrong in that system, one of the hundreds, maybe thousands of papers that have looked for that would have found um, a consistent pattern, and we just haven't found that. So where that leaves us is now in the last 20 years, in 1998, there was an amazing um, group of researchers who I was end up being trained by, which is amazing, um, David Rubineau and Peter Schmidt at the National Institute of Mental Health in America. They're both psychiatrists, um, and they did a, have done a series of experiments to really show um, the biology of PMDD in the brain and how the the neurons and the you know the cells of the brain <clears throat> Respond differently to hormones and process hormones differently in people with PMDD so that even though the hormone changes are normal The the neur the neurons the cells of the brain do not react normally to these hormones um, and so it's certainly and so PMDD is certainly triggered by a gynecologic process of course, the cycle is a gynecologic process, and if we shut the cycle down, we can improve symptoms in most cases. Um, and so it's totally fair to, 
you know, um, list it there, cross list it there. Um, on the other hand, um, if, if we're going to say, you know, where, this is my opinion, if we're going to say where does um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder fit in terms of where in the body um, is the pathology, where are things going wrong, where's the abnormal function in the body, it really seems to be in the brain. Um, and so, again, if we can think about the fields of psychiatry, psychology, mental health providers, really <clears throat> the way that those fields have been going for a long time is that the brain is just part of the body. It's just another organ. It's probably the most important organ. It's the most complex organ. It's the most difficult to understand, you know, where it's been slow progress. Um, and so, um, you know, the, uh, the, the field is, is still working on it, you know, and really we've only identified this abnormal sensitivity in 1998. So, what is it? Yeah, I mean, that's 20 years, I guess, 21 years. So it's, it's, in, it's early days. So it's cross-listed in the ICD-11 under um, genitourinary, which is the gynecologic section, and um, the mental behavioral developmental disorders section. It means there's something happening in the brain. Something is off in the way the brain is processing hormones, and that's the reason it's there brains of people with PMDD, you know, whether we're doing um, imaging studies, um, we can see um, uh, everything's better with a brain picture, right? We can see how the brains of people with PMDD respond differently to, um, to hormone changes um, from controls. Um, and we can see it in their genetics um, when we take cells that were grown from their DNA. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's just very clear at this point that 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 is the place to look for the biology of PMDD. So cross-listed under um, gynecology and, um, and uh, mental disorders, which would be like psychiatry or psychology. But um, again, when you hear that word mental, don't think crazy, you know, you're making it up, we're gonna send you to a mental institution. That's not what is meant by that. What is meant is, there's a biological brain difference that we're trying to figure out and treat. And there are a lot of really promising treatments on the horizon. So Sopranolone um, uh, out of um, uh, Backstrom's lab in um, Sweden as Arena Pharma, the, the um, company he started, um, is very promising. And that, that drug works in the brain um, to block the effects of the metabolites of progesterone. So that drug is not changing hormones. It's changing the effects of the metabolites of hormones in the brain. Um, so anyway, I hope that that, um, you know, answers that question. I know it's a, <clears throat> it's very difficult <clears throat> because there is so much baggage there. Um, but try to, um, just kind of um, recognize that the wor the words may mean something to you because of our stigmatized history with mental health, um, perhaps particularly in America, but I think everywhere, um, that, you know, really it doesn't mean that anymore. It means a brain disorder. All right. Um, in the end, you know, uh, in terms of providers who can treat PMDD and should treat PMDD, <clears throat> I said this before, but... I think it's great that it's cross-listed in two places because it's just two, it's two groups of physicians that we can hold accountable to and train to be aware of and help people with PMDD and PME instead of one, right? So we can reach out to both gynecologists and psychiatrists and say, hey, there's a new ICD-11 disorder that, you know, um, is... Uh, you know, it's listed under your specialty, and we want to make sure that you have the tools that you need to um, to diagnose and treat it yourself, and to train your residents and your interns and <clears throat> your graduate students um, in competent care for these people. Um, so I think it's great that it's cross-listed. It's a you know, it's a brain disorder that's triggered. It's a brain express disorder. You know, that's triggered by by normal gynecological function um, and. You know, I think there's no, it's complicated and there's no reason to sort of dig in and, you know, um, have a big fight about it, I think. I think we need everybody on board to help and to um, be aware of the condition. All right. Um, <clears throat> does this mean um, PMDD will take an, be taken out of the DSM-5? Absolutely not. In fact, I think it means it will be further... Um, developed, I think it protects 
um, PMDD's space in DSM-5, and I think it also it, it validates the, um, the choices that they made to include it, and that psychiatrists uh, made to include it in the DSM-5, <clears throat> and um, I think may even encourage the inclusion of more um, reproductive-related issues or specifiers, like, for example, um, PMDD subtypes that do that <clears throat> have a heavy um, physical component versus those that don't. Um, that might be an important subtype to be able to code in terms of predicting treatment response. Um, I'm going to take a drink really quick. Also, um, <clears throat> also, I think we really, um, my my opinion is that we you know really should consider having a specifier. Um, in the DSM-6, <clears throat> um, the next one won't be out for a while, but um, for premenstrual exacerbation uh, or cyclical exacerbation of an underlying disorder, because, you know, there is evidence that people with women with schizophrenia, women with bipolar disorder, women with major depression, um, women with females with panic disorder, with um, post-traumatic stress disorder, there's a high prevalence, oh, borderline personality disorder, alcohol use disorder. There's a really long list of, of disorders that can be exacerbated premenstrually. Um, and in the case of depression, which is the only one we have um, available to us, we know that about 60% of people, females with a depressive disorder have premenstrual exacerbation of that disorder. And yet we have no developed treatments for that. The ones that we've tried haven't worked. The PMDD treatments often don't work for the premenstrual exacerbation of depression. So that's something that I'm working on and I think is really important to work on, but right now we don't have a specifier um, in the DSM-5 for <clears throat> um, premenstrual exacerbation of a disorder and it might be a really important factor to keep in mind for a clinician when they're trying to treat um, someone who has this disorder. It might um, you know, m might make the difference between somebody, you know, being successfully treated for their schizophrenia or, you know, being sort of lost. So I think that um, uh, inclusion of PMDD in the ICD-11 will hopefully um, validate and encourage those who fought, the psychiatrists who fought really hard, and psychologists who fought really hard to get PMDD um, uh, validate, uh, codified in the DSM-5 in the first place. And hopefully, we'll inspire them um, to um, to further include this these issues in the the coming iterations of the DSM five. And I'm going to say it again. I think we need multidisciplinary treatment teams. You know, psychiatrists who um, use the DSM five. You know, need to um, need to be aware of how to prescribe, you know, SSRIs and oral contraceptives, of course, but they really, I think, have a responsibility, um, especially if they're in a women's health clinic, to learn how to administer some of these more advanced evidence-based treatments for PMDD, because so many people are um, left without any more options after that. So I'm hoping psychiatrists will also um, sort of be inspired by this cross-listing and learn how to do some of the hormone-based treatments as well that gynecologists have typically administered. Um, at our clinic here at UIC, we have psychiatrists who have learned how to administer Lupron, for example, um, which is the medical menop the injections from um, temporary medical menopause. Anyway, so I think that all of this, again, comes back to big win for PMDD sufferers, hopefully big win eventually for PME sufferers as well. Um, uh, hopefully this means that providers across disciplines can be held accountable and trained um, and not just held accountable that sounds like I'm their mother or something but like, uh, engaged and made into partners and made into um, you know uh, uh, fellow you know advocates in this area that um, we can we can collaborate with okay. and so thank you so much for sticking with us and um, yeah, I hope you um, stay tuned. We're going to have more of these coming. Um, and thanks to Laura for setting this up and getting the, um, the questions all ready. Again, I'll, I'll circle back and um, answer more of these questions once I'm off my phone call. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.